which is great. Mm. Thanks. Thank you so much, man. We appreciate um, th- that input. Um, it's just a habit sometimes, you know, when we have uh, people with positions <laughs> in the same space. But no, um, we appreciate that as well. Uh, Ms. Sushmita Budai. Sushmita? Okay, um, let's try Mr. Sandil Mtembu for now, and then we'll, we'll see if we're able to connect to Sushmita. I, I, I think she's trying to put her mic on at the moment. Bob Mtembu. Okay, um, both for Sushmita and, and Mr. Mtembu, it seems there are some mic issues, but we recognize and affirm that they are in the room because they did try to put on their mics as I've just asked. Um, Mr. Sbia's mic is not showing at all. We said was Sbia. So we're not sure um, if, we're, if, if we're audible, please just um, put your, um, uh, uh, your comments in the chat box. Um, so that we can be able to to engage you further as we go ahead. Okay, I think that that's it for our um, morning check-in. I think we'll we'll have an opportunity to engage again with Mr. Mtembu and Sushmita um, as we go along for the day. As I've indicated, we want to try and engage further on on a, on a variety of issues. Um, one, some of which include um, the ways in which we can start to work with civil society organisations specifically. Um, towards building the sort of political capital that we want to establish in our communities. But before we get to that, um, let, I want to just have sort of an open discussion um, with all of us in this, in this room and in this space around, there's a lot of processes that, that come about specifically from grassroots level of campaigning and mobilization, some of which end up in um, the constitutional court, some of which end up being spread quite largely in the media. Um, what are some of the most significant so, sort of social interest campaigns that you would have picked up on in the past couple of years or in the past maybe 20 years of South Africa's existence? Um, an example to this, what I could talk, talk to is um, the treatment action campaign um, that happened in quite the early 2000s. We remember in this country, we had quite a, a crisis um, in healthcare in particular when it related to the um, disbursement of um, treatment for HIV patients. And um, we had a government at the time that was quite denialist about the, the nature of, 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 of HIV and how the infection itself manifests, what sort of treatment is required and so forth. We then had a civil society organization through the treatment action campaign, which formed a coalition of other organizations that were interested in this particular healthcare issue. Um, that wanted to talk through specifically, how do we make sure um, that government actually hears our voice and we change um, the course of how the legislature is functioning, the, the cabinet itself is functioning in the interests of community members because we had quite a significant um, death rate um, as a result of the HIV and AIDS um, 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 pandemic that we had in this country. Of course, um, through the uh, successful legal lobbying and advocacy campaign that was run by the TAC, which was a multifaceted campaign, it included mobilization at grassroots level, it included um, utilizing opposition political party voices towards ensuring that um, the debate in, in parliament in particular were also different from the ordinary um, conversations that were happening in parliament at the time. We do remember the early 2000s was a time in this country where um, some of the debates weren't as full on as we would have liked considering the, um, the fact that we had just emerged from um, sort of a post-1994 hysteria. We were quite, you know, quite happy with each other uh, for the most part. So the, the, the level of engagement wasn't as, as heightened as it ought to be. But we did see with the treatment action campaign coming through to fruition that it was time for us to be able to hold each other accountable in that way. And that campaign eventually um, allowed for government to actually engage 
specifically with um, 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 its own cabinet, with the judiciary, with all facets of the state, in order to ensure that provision for healthcare for HIV AIDS um, uh, patients um, was, was sufficient and was um, fair in that regard. Since that time, um, um, and the government was able to change its stance. We saw with the um, the Zuma administration, the early years, how the, the fight against HIV and AIDS infection um, increased quite significantly. And most of that can be um, um, uh, brought back to the idea that civil society was a significant um, player in the space. I just want to be able to ask then, um, what are some of the other campaigns that you might be aware of um, that emerged from a grassroots perspective that were able to inform um, government policy, government um, um, work, um, and state machinery, and so forth. You are welcome to raise your hand, unmute yourself, and, and engage. Uh, leadership, if you don't engage, I'll point. <laughs> Bali, were you were you trying to uh, tell us about a campaign that you're you were aware of? Bali? Okay. Um it's both. Uh, someone from the um, university space, you might have something, I I'm sure when you were part of SRC? Is my mic audible? I don't know if I'm talking to myself here. Hey, Bob Isaac. Hello. Hi, guys. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Oh. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, pe people are on strike today. <laughs> I can see this. <laughs> okay. I thought I thought it, I thought the issue was with, with, with on my side because everyone was quiet. Okay. Yes. Um, all right. So since we don't have any takers for now, um, I think I'll just move on to the the essentially outlining some of the campaigns that I'm aware of. If, how many of you guys are aware of the fees must fall campaign? You can raise your hand. You can react on on uh, on on your meeting. Don't don't. Depending on what what device you might be viewing from, there's various reactions that Zoom offers. You can do a thumbs up, put your hand up, put a heart, yeah. uh, put laughter. Yeah. <laughs> um, it keeps on kicking me off. It keeps it kicks you out. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, it kicks me out now and again. Okay. It keeps kicking me out. I, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Can you... It says my network is unstable. I couldn't oh. hear you previously. No, it's okay yeah. then. Um, thank you, but we, we, we appreciate you letting us know. Uh, Mrs. Bonelong Gubane, um, you may address us, did. Mrs. Bonelong Gubane? Am I audible? Yes, you are now. Uh, greetings, uh, leaders. Thank you very much. Greetings, leaders. Uh, I am extremely sorry for being late. I was experiencing technical glitches here and there, but uh, I'm very happy that uh, at the end, everything has been sorted, and uh, I'm happy to join in. Uh, uh, though I'll not uh, have much comment uh, as of this moment, because I'm not privy to the 
discussions that have been discussed and uh, points that have been put across. So I'll just say thank you and I'm happy to, to join again today. I, ho I hope that we're going to have fruitful and prolific discussions going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mnumzan. Has your data issues been sorted from our side? Yes, it, it, has, it has been sorted indeed. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Noto, you may address us. Not uh, according, uh, according to um, the issue of the fees must fall. Yeah. Yeah, in colleges, uh, we are facing a serious issue about that. Uh, the, the, the company fees must fall to a seven day. Mm. So, about seven day are those who are found in universities. Yeah, in colleges, in Ghana, they are coca. When it's first was a good holy, yeah, now you're going to speak on a night. No, I hear you, man. And so for, for, for you um, at colleges, whilst they brought up the right issues for the campaign, um, it's not necessarily seeing fruition for, 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 for the space that you're in. Yeah, yes, yes. We are still, um, yeah, yeah. So, uh, if uzo palamasa po or uku in ini, we have a uh, serious issue calling an air camera in deep rural areas, but uh, by funny mali in colleges, by Chelwood Mary Riches, the Mali, and so on, so on. So, Ilendo fees must fall, I say, in the Sase Gute, not over much. Yeah, no, I hear you. Thank you so much, man. And Mubego is also engaging with us here by the chat box saying he remembers the specific campaign. Um, and um, it, I think it's, it was something that was that emerged from a grassroots position. So what some don't recognize when, it, when they talk about fees must fall is where it actually started. It, it started with universities like University of Zululand, University of Kwazulu Natan, um, uh, rural uh, um, universities in um, Ilokuzan. Uh, the Eastern Cape, such as Nelson Mandela um, in Metropolitan University, um, as well as Fort Hare, but um, as, as well as it, 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 TUT, um, Tswane University of Technology um, in uh, Tswane, um, which eventually led to the, the pickup of this campaign in particular, going to other spaces. The, at the core of that campaign was exclusion, was um, a lack of financial prowess from the student's perspective, but also um, there were there is a big issue in South Africa when it comes to like student hunger um, and and the fact that students sometimes do get eventually admitted to to university, but there's a there's still quite a significant number of students who go to lectures hungry, who go to exams hungry because of the fact that um, they don't have access to economic um, 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 good and all of those sorts of things. As Umnoto is noting at the moment, whilst there was an initial success of the campaign that came through, firstly, the, the no increase announcement that was announced initially as a response of fees must fall. And then further, um, the idea that uh, that was announced um, quite interestingly by the former president Jacob Zuma um, just before the was it Nazareth conference um, to the nation saying um, that from the the year that would follow there would be no um, um, fee in uh, the, the first year students would go to university um, at no cost and so forth but the, the reality of which um, is, is, is might be quite different for a lot of these students. So those are some of the things that we that we recall. Um, what I want to emphasize specifically on this note is that this wasn't the work of university administrators, for instance, to, to, to launch a campaign like this. It wasn't the work of political parties even um, to launch a campaign like this. It was the work of students on the ground mobilizing branch level um, 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 you know, uh, yeah, student polit politicians who were able to launch a campaign like this. It was it had support from a nonpartisan um, space. So when we talk about nonpartisanship, we're not saying that these issues are not are non-political because they are political in essence, but essentially it's about saying across political lines, we want to be able to campaign for something that is in the interest of our constituency. And so when we talk about these types of campaigns, we need to be able to ensure that we maximize 
buy-in from all of the stakeholders. In university space, it was about making sure that um, the, the various student societies and clubs bought in to the concept that was, uh, that, that was picked up um, by the, some of the, the, the student political parties and formations in universities. For the student political formations, once they've been able to, to, to have their own membership buy into this, um, then, then it was also about how do we make sure that the university administration is able to listen to us in a way that's, that's, that's reasonable. One of the powerful mechanisms through which um, these campaigns end up being um, quite significant is the use both of social media, but of traditional media as well. So it is about questioning, how do we use both those tools to ensure that we bring um, to the fore um, the, the various eyes and, and interests of our society so that they're able to understand our plight, they're able to understand exactly what it is that we're fighting for as students on the ground. Um, before I move on, I'd like to take the hand from Ramona and Noto. Ramona first. Thanks, um, sorry, Minoto. Um, if Ramona could go first and then, and then, and then I'll, 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 I'll have you. Okay, no problem. Sure. Ramona? I, I just want, um, sorry, I'm just going to go off a little bit. No problem. Uh, from, from the business school. I, it's not that I don't agree with it. I do agree with it, if done properly. Um, but I just have a question. Um, why do we have uh, uh, universities only in um, our towns or what should I say, CBD? you know, like central, like in Durban, Johannesburg, why are they not building universities within the informal settlements? Because building universities in the informal settlements closer to the schools would actually, uh, it's, for me, it will help uh, uh, in, in people not having to travel so far. Uh, and there's a lot of challenges with where people are from the rural area are going into the cities. Uh, and, and the reason why I say this is because I'm also from a farm. When mm. I came to Durban, I was very backwards. Uh, I'm being honest. I was very backwards. I hated the robots. I hated the fast life because I, I was not used to that. So I, what I'm trying to say is uh, I think it would be better if universities were built closer to home because uh, 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 even the grandparents, some of the children have to leave grandparents at home and come to the cities to actually, you know, find work and, and stuff where we can create job opportunities by building universities there, creating work for, for, for students that have just come out of, of a matric or, or you know, uh, or studying uh, to be a teacher or whatever. So it's just a question, is it possible for that to happen? Or why hasn't it happened? Just, just yeah. a question. Cool. Um, we'll note that question, and then I'll, I'll let Noto speak now. Noto, go for it. In terms of uh, immobilization at the Kulumanga Park, we, in terms of mobilization, is quite really cool because we use our own resources from our own pocket money to mobilize. I echo it to him, but it was Ugusfageli Mali for immobilization. But in all in all, I call it a check to Sugibege Lama Trembu for immobilization. But no, my as he has. Each and every I tremble, like if I could do about dog, Lias Gashigam Shopu Tageko Bona Leo. Okay, no, I hear you. Thank you so much, Minato. Um, so the, there was a question from Uramona saying, why aren't there more universities being built in the spaces in which people occupy, um, like uh, rural areas, like um, uh, more informal settlements and so forth, so for the ease of accessibility. And then Minato's um, comment was around the fact that even with mobilization, there's still quite a significant lack of resources um, at university level or in the space that he occupies. He's feeling that um, this, is, this itself is, 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 is not happening um, be, even when there is a budget allocated for the work. Um, in the chat section, we have U Ngobego Ngobane saying he was a part of that campaign in Swan University of Technology, and now they are currently striking due to the fact that we, they were promised laptops and since um, the, that promise itself um, occurred, they still have not received anything. 
Um, and this is quite significant because if you look at the ways in which universities themselves are functioning at the moment due to the COVID uh, uh, crisis, um, most of them have started to do these types of online engagements. And so um, those elements of trying to um, uh, change the, that, that aspect of work is something that we need to be quite insistent on as part of our grassroots campaigning in particular. Mr. Sandalem Tembo, um, you had raised your hand uh, I don't know if you are still keen to comment. Yeah, Baba. Good morning, everyone. Morning, morning, Lomzan. Am I audible? Yes. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible, dude. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'm sorry, guys, for being late. Uh, network problems. Well, on, on, on the issue of uh, Ms. Ramona, the question that Ms. Ramona um, have raised, um, I've seen, um, if we can take a look at uh, the rural areas, looking at the population from rural areas or from the townships, let me say it like that. In the township or in rural areas, we have uh, maybe five schools because of the population. So Ms. Ramona, taking the university or taking the, um, let's say, um, or building the university in those uh, places or in those areas, um, it will still cripple, um, let me say, or into Ezoyenza, abandabandinga, ngegebeze, beze, bekwale kwane, because of the population yet laying down there. If it's gonna start, let me say, equally, the high schools, as a Makai, people are always questioning in the why there are few high schools in Makai. It is because, oh, Lama High Schools are called in Makai. Why are they far? And students have to travel maybe for two miles to go to school. It is because the population is not conducible to build a school. And so and to the issue of ama 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 universities and that is the same issue so ama universities i think a larger population like in town let's take mm. a, 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 the unizulu ungoy uh, Zuland uh, uh, University. That university is in the center of Skawini, Ngwelezane, Mantlanzini, Mseleni, Richards Bay, um, and other places, Spesagantetwa, uh, Nongoma, Shore. It's in the center, and there are so many people coming to those uh, or to that university. I uh, thank you. Uh, no, thanks, 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 um, Nomzan and Tembu. Um, just one final comment from Umnoto, and then we'll we'll move on with the rest of the session. In terms of Umtembu, a kulumalapa about um, uguti ezinyinga from high school, the suga go te the maha the maha high school, amanya maha high school, agu te gunazo. There was a program, uh, I think, in the Skatiska Skatia is that. Which is that you can go to Gusa to Puma. Is something like a feeding scheme. So we are collecting money from Gute. The son of the leader was calling to Puma to pass it for that. What's the law for that? But Agbona Galan got a lot of money. We in in the one. So initially, I only laugh in terms of the first mass fall campaign. The first mass fall campaign. Everyone who I laugh, I also say as a because. Babe Popule be hamba pambi li be implementa if it must fall, but now a kelin bahamba ama koti ba de using their money u attend a law makala immedia I seko eh, ama politician ama leaders eh, who awa seko to uguzu babuzu kwenza gala ni de a case na kine i hambe anja. So abanye ba pega nenin kinga ba attenda makala ni malzabo immedia I seko se gui bona. Nicole, so yeah. Okay, 
No, thank you for those comments. For now, um, we'll take you in the next phase of the engagement. Um, one, what I want to try and, and, and sort of elucidate too, as it relates to the stuff that we were talking about. One was we had talked about earlier the, the treatment action campaign as it related to HIV AIDS patients. Is the nature of the grassroots mobilization that occurred in that space. We saw a number of national marches um, that were in various spaces that we were trying to, to, to ensure um, people were able to engage um, with the, the, the policy direction, with the fees must fall, the, the, whether it be right or wrong, but the extent of the engagement was such that it was able to start from a grassroots perspective, but it was also able to lead to significant changes in policy direction of the government at the time. Um, when we talk about scholar transport, as you guys were alluding to, um, we, are, we know how rural um, the province of KwaZulu-Natal is. Um, and as a result, there, as we were talking, there are learners, for instance, in Engo to thousands um, um, in Engo to who walked walk more than 10 kilometers to school each day. And that's just one way, right? Um, and um, they were talking about in, in encountering dangerous conditions and sometimes arriving at school too tired to focus. Um, one of the ways in which civil society was a significant player in this space was that um, Equal Education Law Center was able to work with um, both um, um, school scholars themselves, but also able to work with other political formations in KZN um, who were interested in supporting this, this, this particular issue and was able to take um, the KZN Department of Education to court, um, which I think in 2020, they were able to establish a timeline about when the scholar transport um, situation would become an actual thing. So when we talk about um, grassroots mobilization, when we talk about getting buy-in from, from various stakeholders, Let's try as political parties not forget the potential impact of civil society organizations that could happen. We recall also um, um, in, the, in the years prior how there was a campaign called Save South Africa in the country. Um, where, whether we sit on, on um, the, we affirm that movement or not, but we did see the significant impetus that was brought by a campaign such as that, that involved a number of um, um, NGOs, a number of civil society organizations towards a campaign that they wanted to see that the interests of South Africa were preserved in, 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 in the ways in which they, they outlined in their manifestos. So for branch level executives, for political parties working in communities, um, it's important that we prioritize the relationships that we build with civil society organizations. It's important that we prioritize the relationships that we build with, with um, uh, formations within our local community because of the work that they often um, um, take in, in that regard. Um, we do note um, the apologies from Sushmita on behalf of Savina. We, we understand and we, we hope that um, all goes well um, in that regard. Um, so basically, that's essentially what I wanted to, to say. Sometimes you find that with, with the formations that we have um, at, at community level, even the level of um, membership is sometimes higher than some of the political parties in the space, but there doesn't seem to be any real conversations between the formations and the political parties that exist in that space as well. So it's important that to try and cultivate relationships on the basis of um, issues that are common to the interests of that community, regardless of political affiliations, because if we aren't able to talk with civil society as political parties, it means that we potentially lose track and lose the, 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 the sort of legitimacy that we want to encounter um, in, in that space. Um, not all, and then Mr. Smone Songuban, uh, you may make your comment. Not all. Oh, yes, yes, as well. Bonnie Sanders, I can see the puzzle bar. How no, it's a secretary. Okay, sure. <laughs> Mr. Smolilong so, Gubane, um, you wanted to make a comment uh, earlier? Yes, uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Good. Uh, no, thank you very much, uh, my leader. Uh, greetings uh, to all the fellow colleagues. Uh, the topic that uh, we're discussing today is a very interesting and very important topic, speaking directly to the heartbeat of our nation, which is young people and the education system, which is employed in South Africa. 
Uh, I would like to just delve deeper into the issue of FISMA's fall because um, I was one of those uh, who, who, who took part very actively uh, in the FISMA's fall. Uh, but you know, the FISMA's fall has been misinterpreted uh, by the media and, uh, and, and, by the, and by the doom prophets who like to make public opinions on issues that they have little understanding about. The, the FISMA's fall movement is not a movement which said fees as in uh, fees only must fall. It was much broader than that. The fees must fall. It said on campus, remember that before the fees must fall uh, took full effect, there was roads must fall first. And the road must fall, it said, but we can't be existing in institutions of higher learning. And in these institutions of higher learning, you still have colonial statues of people who represent nothing but pure and sheer pain to our people, exploitation and racism. We can't be still preserving such people and celebrating such people in our 25 years of democracy. So therefore we said they must fall, meaning that not them as in the sense of the weight, but what they represent, the symbolical representation of what they represent, it must fall because what they represented, they represented a conquering of a nation, they represented a, a, a subjugation of a certain race under another race. And then after that, we said, we are a fallism movement, meaning that we're saying, we're saying in campuses, we're saying the abuse of women, the abuse of our sisters, both uh, sexually, emotionally, and otherwise, it must fall. That is why you even saw our sisters, you know, when they were protesting, they just stripped themselves naked so that they can be able to, to really relay a message which says, our bodies are subjected to these kind of conditions on a daily and continuous basis. But these stories of us are never told on a mainstream media. So therefore, we are deciding on our own that we should be able to be the ones who are telling our story. Our story must not be told through the media or by a third party. We must be the ones who are doing it. That is why we even said, hashtag there is nothing about us without us. It was primarily and fundamentally because on the, uh, of those grounds. So, this must fall. It said every student must be able to receive education. Education must be received on merit. Education must not be received based on the fact that I'm able to pay and you are not able to pay. So therefore, I am able to, I'm eligible to, to get to the institution of higher learning and receive education. Education, in order for education to be a transformation, that will be to be a tool of transformation that will be used to transform both the society and the African continent as a whole. It must be inclusive, it must be comprehensive, it must include everyone, regardless of their socioeconomic status or standing. That is primarily and fundamentally what the FISMAS fall stood for. That is why I encourage people to therefore understand the plight and struggle of students. Again, I would like to, uh, to uh, as my parting shot, I would like to go back to the point which was made by uh, Comrade Umnoto, to say, I'm a student, I'm a student activist. They are now attending uh, court cases. They are now, uh, you know, they are really uh, suppressed and, and, and are very uh, oppressed by the very same judicial system and by all these other systems which are there. But if you look at these people, these people are not thieves. These people are not criminals. What they wanted to do, just like our fathers, just like our mothers, just like our grandfathers, when they fought the evil system of apartheid, they did far more worse than us for justice. But what we did, we just, there's nothing that we did actually. 
But what we did, we just stood. But because in South Africa, there is this agenda of disintegrating young people. What happened is that they were able to separate us by setting an example with setting and selected, selected leaders by giving them criminal charges and therefore making it uh, make, sending a clear example to others who may want to also participate in the struggle for financial liberation of students in the future. That if you endeavor to participate in this particular platform, this is what is going to, to, to happen to you. So I'm saying, uh, that is why we even formed the student union because we said as young people, there is nothing that we can ever do uh, which is consolidated as long as we still prioritize our political affiliations because political affiliations in our struggle are the key hindrance and obstacle towards us achieving our consolidated uh, coincided goals. So I'm saying we still have a long way to go, but also we need the support of our parents, we need the support of the private sector, we need the support of government, we need the support of everyone, because what we're fighting for is not ours, but it's for future generations. Thank you, Melit. Thank you, um, Sponello. In short, just to try and engage you a bit further on that, um, the idea of getting buy-in from the various stakeholders. And firstly, would you say that your organization is a political one? Uh, by organization, you mean the student union? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The student union is an anti-political, is a, is a non-political uh, movement, which brings together various political activists within its ranks to show and to demonstrate clearly that we can be able to coexist in spite of our political differences because ours is much more bigger than the political differences. And also, that which uh, divides us is much smaller and it's much more insignificant than that which unites us. We are saying political spectrum and political beliefs have made us to be more uh, to be more loyal to political parties than who are loyal to the struggle itself, and this is self defeating to the cause of which we are trying to achieve. Okay, so you are an, an anti political movement operating in a political space. Indeed, indeed, yes. So, you, so, so would you say you have political power in your institution? No, 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 we, we do not have political power because remember, in order for you to, to have political power, you must first contest SRC elections. Now, if you do not contest in that space, you, you have no political power at all. Remember the nature of, of how institutions of higher learning and colleges work. You, ha you first have to contest the Student Representative Council, which is contested through the political mechanism. And, and we, we tried by all means to reflect refrain from doing that because by doing so, it means we'll have to campaign. And by campaigning, it means we'll have to speak badly about certain political parties and we'll have to promote ourselves in the process, therefore contributing to the division that we have diagnosed and identified as the main hindrance to our struggle. Do when political parties campaign? Um, sorry, guys, I'm jump, uh, for for doing this back and forth with Ulokuzane Ukubane. It's just I want to try I want to try and get and, and get this point as succinct as possible. And so far as the relationship between political parties, um, citizens, as well as um, non-political formations or civil society. Um, and I apologize if it's taking a bit of some time, but I, I just want to make this point as clear as possible. Gisbonilis and Noto will get to you in a moment. Um, Nguban, um, as, we, as we talk about, so you guys are not, don't contest, but do you feel that you have the ability to influence um, like where people vote in, 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 in that space or how people cast their votes or what, what campaigns are most significant at the time? Well, absolutely. Uh, in effect, in any case, we have been approached by certain political parties, of which I'm not going to reveal, uh, who, who have come to us and said, but you are growing in numbers. Why don't you uh, form an alliance with us? You know, you know because when we, 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 we initiated the student union, remember that the student union was initiated by political activists who come from different political organizations with an understanding, Lita Brian, that we have 
been participating in these political structures and these political movements. But it has been very much difficult for us to come together, put aside our political differences, and forge a progressive, consolidated way forward towards us ensuring that we are really, uh, you know, pull out a major uh, effort to university management, which is our primary enemy, by the way. Uh, we can't do that because you have to be loyal and you have to, you have to toe the line. You have to toe the line, a certain political line. Now, if you're under the student union, there is no line that you are towing here. You are speaking directly and there is no line that you'll tow. You are just speaking directly without any fear of, you know, breaking any organizational boundaries, which is political and, you, and all those things. So we're saying the students must be able to find a way forward. Because, you know, Brian, there are things that we can agree on semantically. We may agree on the approach, we may disagree on the approach, but fundamentally we all agree. We're all students and we're all working class uh, uh, as children and we're all oppressed. So we cannot differ on that one. No matter how we may differ, but on that one, we will always be united. So that is why I was saying, that which you divide us is much more insignificant and smaller than that which unites us. Okay, that's exactly, thank you very much Mungobane for entertaining me and I hope everyone was, 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 was okay with that. But essentially, it's, it, the last, his parting shot was the essence of why we had this discussion initially, was the fact is, as political parties, we, the difference most often is ideological. It's all about um, articulating what the principles and values that you as a party uphold. And don't, that's fine for you guys to be able to differentiate on that basis. But if as in, in, in serving your communities, you can agree to certain things that limit your mobility as citizens, that limit your, your access to resources as citizens, that limit your access to services. If you can find common basis with civil society organizations, whilst they don't contest politically, NGOs, community-based organizations, churches, and all of those things, whilst they don't contest for the same uh, positions and, and, and occupations as you do, they also have political power, right? They have the ability to sway people's feelings and thoughts and emotions towards specific issues. So it's vital and important for you as, as political formations who are contesting for that power and space to be in conversation with these organizations because in some respects they can even undo a lot of the work that you that you that you do in in, in the various spaces we saw in in the last two i think two or three elections um the nature of how um basam Jondolo, for instance um was 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 used as a political um um um, um tool. Um, when I say this, I don't, I don't say it with any specific judgment or whatever, but essentially in one of the elections, they were siding with, with, with one of the parties. In another election, they decided to side with a different party because they felt that the party that they had sided with initially wasn't serving their interests. This party was taking them to court and all of those sorts of things. Um, and so in the following um, um, elections, they were able to side with a different party. Of course, it's also important for those civil society organizations to stand firm on what their values are when they become, when they are seen in partnership with political formations and political organizations, right? So it's important that values both of the political formation as well as the civil society movement are not impugned as a result of the relationship that gets formed. But what I'm saying is it's important for us as political parties to recognize that these political formations have political power. They have the ability to sway certain people towards or away from casting their vote in your favor. So that's, that's one very important thing that we must, we must be able to negotiate as we undertake the process of building relationships at grassroots level. Uh, Mr. Mtembu, I'm going to take your hand um, and then I'm going to hand over to Umnum Zane, Isaac Kambula for the next couple of sessions. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mtembu. You see, Mr. Mtembu, the problem about uh, the civil society movements or the community-based organizations is that when these organizations formed, people who take the, the executive um, or, or the strategic position are people from political parties. So that's the problem. Looking at the SGPs, most of the SGPs are formed 
or afraid by a certain political party individuals. Going to back to uh, the community-based organization, any organization in the community is filled by a person or people, maybe the chairperson is coming from another political party. So me as the, uh, uh, the opposition, uh, when I came to uh, negotiate with, with that uh, uh, um, uh, formation or with that uh, based uh, community, I mean, uh, what is this? I'm, 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 community-based organization. Yes, a community-based organization. The one, the chairperson who is there coming from another political party, like we, we clash. <laughs> Mm, yeah. Mm. yeah, that's the problem that we we come across when we when we are in societies. Thank you. Yeah, um, and and in some respects, that that's that's quite a valuable feedback because even it, it, no one is free of political affiliations, right? It's difficult to engage um, with with some formations at community level because of the affiliation that comes across. But w even when you note, for instance, in the rural areas, some um, of the tr traditional leadership is quite clearly aligned to one party or the other. So these are things that we, we need to try and navigate. But as a political party as well, um, what tools are you utilizing in order to negotiate with, 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 with these individuals? To what extent does your conversation uh, linger only on um, um, sort of um, when, when do you engage? So is it during an election period? Um, is it at a time when um, elections themselves are not as active as they, as they ordinarily would be? Um, are you engaging? towards advancing purely community needs because um, those are those are those are somewhat different to some issues which might challenge the political dynamic of that area as well so that's part of the of the course but of course not all of these um, um, conversations will go as meaningfully as we want them to but it's important that we start thinking clear, uh, for ourselves at branch level about how can we activate that space where civil society and, and so community-based organizations themselves are activated in order for us to be able to um, be relevant within that community space. Um, and, and quite often, as, a, as, a, as, a, as someone who's not a fan of the ways in which some political parties campaign, you don't have to de-campaign other political parties um, in order to advance your own um, political uh, significance in that space. Not all of the time do you need to uh, speak ill or, 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 or speak against what some political parties are saying, but saying it's important to offer an alternative. Um, and the comparison or the contrast of that alternative needs to be able to stand on its own two feet without the need to denigrate um, other political foundations and formations. But of course, it's a, it's a very dicey uh, space to be able to operate in. I think that aspect of the workshop around negotiation, mediating, and all of those sorts of things around how do you campaign um, in order to maintain or establish relevance in a community that is quite clearly aligned to one space or is quite divided um, is, is, I think, a workshop on its own. But I think it's a, a thank you for those discussions so far. Um, and I think as the day goes on, we'll, we'll try to, to, to touch back and touch base on those. Um, thank you for your time as well again. Um, Dr. Kambule, um, you are now uh, on the floor. Uh, thank you, Spa, for that informative session. And I'd like to reflect on the session that you've also just had with Spa as the entire participants. Uh, if there's one thing that was coming out strongly towards the end, it's this idea of coming up with a political movement. And that's probably one of the key questions that we are having as South Africans. And as we rightly saw yesterday, that Temen Mashaba had his bid to register Action SA as a political party shut down by the Electoral uh, Commission of South Africa. And that on its own, again, raises certain questions. As we have heard from the one gentleman that, that was speaking from the uh, Student Union chapter, the one thing that they're proposing is that they are not a political movement. But then again, the question becomes, can you really be a political? Because if you're in a political space, and you stand for certain political uh, goals or certain political objectives, at the end of the day, you are participating in a political space. So by virtue of being apolitical, we are also being political in that uh, instance. So which is why, again, it's bringing us to the very interesting case of Herman Mashaba and Action SA, because now they want to contest elections. 
And yet again, they do not identify themselves as a political party, but as a form of a broader societal organization that has certain goals that it wants to impart on the South African context. So having said that, uh, thank you, Spa, for such an informative session, again, on issues of uh, campaigning and the role of civil society in South Africa. Uh, looking back to the history of South Africa, as we understand, even through uh, the AIDS case in South Africa, we understand that it was through the role of civil society in influencing the decisions that are taken by government in as far as going to the constitutional court to have the government administering uh, antiretroviral to the larger population in South Africa. And again, that is an example of how powerful civil society can be. And now, since we are moving to the sessions focusing on party coalitions, there are certain things that we also, again, need to take forward because I think the issue of civil society in party coalitions has not been forthcoming in most cases because, as you understand, you have different political parties that have different interests. So what happens when both political parties or three political parties cannot agree on one particular common goal. And then the issue there, or the answer there becomes that, but you still have civil society. What is the role of civil society then in also assisting such political parties mediate some of the ideological differences that they have, and they can also be policy differences that they may have. So I'd like to share the presentation it's just four to five slides that uh, I will share with you, focusing on party coalition in South Africa. Uh, I don't know if everyone can see the screen I'm sharing. Yes, yes, we can see. Okay. Yes, okay, thank you so much. So as, as I've mentioned, for this particular session, we'll be focusing more on party coalitions, the nature of party coalitions, uh, and some of the challenges that we are observing in party coalitions. And uh, as I've stated, the issue of political coalitions is something that has been forthcoming in South Africa for a, a number of reasons. And the main reason has been the declining uh, electoral victory of the ANC uh, up to the 2019 general elections whereby, uh, especially starting from the 2016 general election at the local government level, where we realized that the ANC was starting to fail to reach a certain, a certain threshold or to become the majority party through uh, a 50 plus one mandate in order to be the leading party. And that on its own created or a vacuum whereby majority of the South African political party, especially focusing on your smaller political parties, had a role to play in terms of influencing the outcomes of government. And again, so those are some of the cases that we'll focus on. But before we move on to such things, we must understand that again, in post-apartheid South Africa, one particular problem that we have been experiencing is the pitfalls of one party dominance when the country's fifth democratically elected parliament between 2014 and 2019 faced growing corruption, state capture, the undermining of parliamentary oversight, and the abuse of political power in state institutions for nefarious gains for the leading political party or the dominant political party. And at the end of the day, these particular events threaten the country's constitutional democracy and its principles of, accountability, of an accountable government as, as the ruling party undermine parliamentary oversight structures through majoritarianism as a strategy of evading accountability, right? And again, that also has also impacted in terms of ensuring that we hold the executive to account, right? And this again, as we realize, it led to a, a growing coexistence and cooperation of opposition parties in the South African parliament. And that particular cooperation was mainly focusing on challenging the dominance of the ANC through what we might term as informal coalitions, right, between the various parties such as your EFF, your GA, your GDM, your IFP, and other smaller political parties that are in the South African parliament. But then again, what we also realize is that this particular problem or this particular process resulted in the establishment of formal and informal coalitions in governing key metros. And as we understand, 
the metropolitan municipalities are at the center of economic development in South Africa, and again, are, also, are increasingly becoming the epicenter of the political background. Right? So those are some of the issues, or that is uh, the background that we have in the South African context. But then in terms of really getting the gist of what do we mean by political uh, coalitions, right? So. Firstly, those are the actionable key items that we'll have. So firstly, we'll need to understand party coalitions, and then we'll also need to understand the rationale behind party uh, coalitions. And then thirdly, we'll also need to focus on the types of coalitions that we see in the political space. And lastly, we'll then look at some of the challenges to party coalitions in South Africa. And again, I'd really like us to participate meaningfully by reflecting on some of the challenges that uh, we've seen are forthcoming in some of the coalitions that uh, some of the governing parties have been, especially in our key metros, right? So how do we then understand coalitions, right? So that basically form of organized political parties or political structures that have a certain political goal. And that political goal is always oriented towards being the governing party at the end of the, of the election. And then again, we'll realize when we move on to the types of coalitions that you can also have coalitions that occur before elections and coalitions that occur after elections, right? But then again, as I've mentioned, they can also involve various parties, right? And in most cases, it can be parties that uh, come from different ideological backgrounds. For example, if you go to Japan or, for, or if you go to Norway, you'd realize that in Japan, the Social Democratic Party has been a majority party, but then in being a majority party, there is still a majority party that does not necessarily even reach 50% of the threshold that is required to be a majority party. In most cases, they will end up with a 34% or 35%, and they will require to be in a coalition with another part. And then in, in most cases in Japan and in Norway and in other countries as Germany, you realize that that particular space is breeding the need for some of the parties that are leaning towards your social democratic parties or your conservative parties to form coalitions. And as I've mentioned, so in the case of Norway, you'd realize that it is the Green Party that has formed some sort of a coalition with the, social, with the socialistic democratic party. So there is quite evident that there is a certain political agenda at heart. Because if you look at the Green Party or also looking at the social party, you'd realize that they are based on social democratic means as compared to maybe your conservative parties that tend to cater more for traditional means of, uh, poli of politicians and again in terms of economic development. And as I've mentioned again, so one particular thing that is always at heart is the issue of setting political goals, right? And in most cases, there has to be a certain or a particular agreement in terms of the distribution or the sharing of power, of, then, of which then becomes particularly important in the South African context as to what happens whenever we have coalitions, right? I don't know if I can open this on the floor as to what has been the nature of the agreement on the distribution of power in coalitions at our local government uh, at our local government uh, municipalities, or even again at our metropolitan municipalities. Uh, I'd, I'd like to open that to the floor as to what have we witnessed in terms of the distribution or the sharing of power, especially if you look at the example of uh, the Nelson Mandela metropolitan municipality. Any takers? Any takers? Uh, Lida? Yes, Lida, go ahead. Yes, uh, no, I, I, I didn't get the question. I just wanted to, was it a question? Yes, it's, it was a question as to what have we been observing in terms of the agreement on the distribution of power amongst parties that are sharing power in our local government system? And again, you can also use the example of 
one is back. We can use the example of uh, city of Tuane. We can use the example of poly, of, uh, of PE where, through the Nelson Mandela municipality. Uh, indeed, Lita. Uh, thank you very much for making these examples. Uh, you see, Lita, uh, the nature of uh, coalition uh, politics uh, it's that, it, it, is that you see, for instance, there is political expediency yes, and, and, and there is a organizational interest at play also. For, mm. instance, uh, for instance, I will make an example. Uh, I, I know I see the one of Nelson Mandela Bay. I'm going to come back to it, but I want to make the one, uh, an example on the one of, uh, of Joe Beck, where him and Mashaba was mayor. Mm. You, you, you see what happened there is that, for instance, uh, the EFF were kingmakers. Mm. And, uh, and uh, what happened is that, so as they were kingmakers, they, they, they wanted to have bargaining power. Mm. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and also later, what happened is that, so they wanted to dictate the terms of this coalition and to make sure that their policies as an organization are, are being fulfilled or are being advanced by Hemen Mashaba. But Hemen Mashaba was not a political employee of the EFF, was a political mm. employee of the DA. So the, yes, EFF, yes. the EFF put down uh, prerequisite conditions which will... Uh, uh, which basically the, uh, this, co this uh, coalition will be premised upon. Mm. And, and, and they said, if you can insource a certain number of workers to be permanent within the municipality or within the metro, uh, we can guarantee you vote within the council. Yes. And also, uh, Herman Mashaba was hell-bent on the issue of uh, uh, foreign nationals having documentation and operating legally and giving black South African citizens an opportunity to trade without uh, unfair competition from, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 the foreign nationals. Yes, and yes. what had happened is that that position of the many positions that Herman Mashaba took they were, po they were politically inclined with the EFF. That is why even the EFF used to say, in Hemen Mashaba, they have their own mayor. Mm. So, so, so I'm saying, as a parting shot, uh, I'm saying, you know, coalition politics ends up not delivering to the interest of the people. Because you see what happens inside those councils. They fight. And you, you find out that there is a budget sitting, a council sitting, which must sit and approve a budget. And because of these petty organizational differences and uh, political differences of, of allocating each other seats and everything else, you find out that that particular sitting collapses due to maybe it doesn't quorum, the number doesn't correlate. And uh, who suffers at the end? It's us, the marginalized, the poor citizens at the end of the day, because at the end of the day, the metro is not functioning properly. And if the metro is not functioning properly, the city will not be able to provide the proper services uh, to the people. Thank you, my lead. Thank you, my leader. Uh, do we have any other people who would like to make an input on that, on the agreement in terms of the distribution of power in coalitions? As, as I've mentioned, we've seen them in Johannesburg, we've seen them in Johannes, we've seen them in PE, right? Probably whoever wants to take this can also refer to the case of Port Elizabeth as to how effective was it? Was it not effective? What are some of the challenges that they faced? But then again, going back to my leader, as, as you rightly pointed out to some of the challenges, right? But there are people on the other hand who also argue that through the insourcing of workers, the lives of the working class has improved. For example, you'd realize that in, um, in the Johannesburg Metropolitan Municipality, security guards and cleaners were earning less than 3,500 strands a month. For example, if I give you the case of security guards, they were earning less than 3,500 strands a month, but the, the municipality was paying the service provider 12,000 strands per security guard, right? So meaning that 
The service provider was taking a, a huge share of the salary that was supposed to be going to who? To, to the workers. So that's on its own. It has led to an improvement into the, in the working conditions of the people who are in source. But then again, it is quite important for us that whenever we are analyzing situations, we must also look at some of the pros and cons of the emerging results of such uh, coalitions or, or decisions that are taken based on coalitions. So yeah, I, I'll continue opening it to the floor, particularly focusing on the distribution of power. Just to further give you an example, if you look at what happened in the Nelson Mandela Metropolitan Municipality, you'd realize that the MMC positions within that particular municipality were used as a bargaining chip amongst political parties, right? So at the end of the day, it was not necessarily about putting the interest of the people in the forefront. It was more about giving out seats to political parties that are going to support the ambitions of that political party that had probably the majority vote uh, in that particular municipality. So those, again, are some of the emerging issues in the South African context as to how is the brokerage of power within that particular network of coalitions used to either fulfill the interest of the society or the interest of communities in that particular metropole, or is it only used to to fulfill the interest of the political parties that is at the helm in that particular municipality. So those are some of the issues that are quite emerging. And again, we can also see this being used in some of the tendering processes whereby political parties that are supporting the leading coalition government in that particular municipality are guaranteed to have some of their funders receive tenders from that particular municipality. And we have seen this often in a number of cases. Even to this particular day, Gideon Bowen, who is the finance minister, is still holding on to certain reports that everything show corruption through party coalitions. And we must also understand again that these particular, particular coalitions, if we look at the rationale then as to why do people form coalitions, right? So for example, some people, form coalitions to maximize their chances of winning elections, right? We have seen this in countries such as Zimbabwe through the MDC, whereby the smaller political parties will use MDC as their political home through some form of coalition and then go and contest the election in order to increase or improve their chances of standing or increase their chances of winning the elections, right? But then in most cases, we've often seen, again, based on what we'll cover in the following uh, session on conflict management as to how such parties, again, are also facing some internal dilemmas that result in political conflicts that then undermine the very purpose of coalition, right? And again, to give you another example, if you look at the second term of, uh, the, of the former, pres of pre former president Zuma, you'd realize that there was a, that particular coexistence, as we also term it in some of the work that we've done, there was that particular co coexistence or informal coalition amongst political parties to strengthen the means of accountability in parliament in realization that the majority party is using the division that it sees in the parliament and it's also using its major, majoritarianism tactics because it had more than 60% in the parliament to actually ensure that it can evade accountability. And that is where then you realize that coalitions are starting to become more and more important in trying to in trying to uh, in trying to counter the existing or the status quo of political parties in that particular context again, right? And again, we must also realize that the rationale behind coalitions is that they are likely to strengthen democratic principles, right? And this is as opposed to one political party taking all the decisions, right? But then, so what we are seeing here is the emergence of something that we'd rather call the governing or the government by consensus, whereby certain political parties that fail to reach the majority status of 50 plus one will then 
work with other political parties and try to form a certain consensus as to what is it that they can achieve and how far they can move forward and, or, or even how best can such political parties move forward with that particular movement, right? And we saw this in the South African context again through the EFF and the DA, through the UDM and other political parties in certain spaces, right? And as I've mentioned, these coalitions can also work best to ensure that there is no emerging technical issues that are emerging, for example, in cases such as your Rwanda, whereby you realize that you have the Hutus and the duties. So having a government that is able to work with other political parties then is able to suppress some of the emerging issues that are related to ethnicities. Again, in countries such as, uh, such as Nigeria, you realize that determining as to who becomes the main president is also drawn along certain ethnicities, right? And those are some of the problems that coalitions can try and identify as some of the problems. And then only through coalitions can, or, or, or only through a co-governing system can we as governments at the end of the day, try to suppress any underlying motives that uh, would likely jeopardize the democratic outcomes of any government, right? But then again, the question then becomes as to how do different ideologies impact on coalition, right? And we have seen this in the South African context, and I will again open it to the floor as to what do we believe that are some of the rationales behind party coalitions? And moving on from rationales, how have or how has the issue of ideological differences in South Africa impacted on some of the coalition governments that we had? Leader. Yes, my leader. Can I come in? Yes, you may come in, my leader, and I'm going to give you two minutes, my leader, so that we can give time to other people as well. Okay, my leader. No, thank you. I don't know. I don't. I don't intend to hold this discussion to monopoly. <laughs> uh, uh, indeed, leader. I think you are raising a very pertinent issue when when we are discussing that issue of saying, you know, for instance, I'd like to make a pragmatic example of the EFF and the DA. Nice. Uh, you see, the EFF and the DA, they they were in coalition in most in most metros, right? Hmm. Because because of their hate. Oh, I, I don't want to theme it as hate. Uh, yeah, I would theme it as hate of ANC's corruption. Mm. Uh, they said, because you remember, Julius Malema even once said that DA is a better devil than, uh, than, than, than the ANC. And them citing with the DA uh, is primarily premised on those reasons. So you see that this coalition, it was not premised on the ideological inclination. Mm. None whatsoever. So eventually, it was not bound to work because you remember that when it came to the National Assembly and they needed to vote on the issue of the land of expropriation without compensation, the DA voted otherwise. And, mm. and, and, and the EFF proposed a motion to test water that uh, is this uh, coalition between them and DA really of substance? Because if you look at the EFF, they are a far left uh, movement and the DA is a far right movement. So mm. it, eventually it was not going to work. It was just not going to work. It was uh, very uh, obvious from the get-go that it was not going to work because what they, 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 they consolidated their relationship upon was just a mere hate of ANC's corruption. Now, you can see that that is not sustainable because EFF has its own objectives, DA has its own objectives. Now, if they cannot back each other up in, 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 a, in a form of voting for each other's motion, both in the legi provincial legislatures and in the national, in, in the, sorry, in the, what you call, in the National Assembly, it was not going to be sustainable. It is precisely for those reasons, Lita, that I agree with you that ideological factor or element has contributed largely both to the success and both to the failure of these coalitions. Thank you, my leader. Thank you, my leader. I see that, Spooni, so you have your hand up. You may have the floor. Yes, thank you, leader. Um, yeah, I just wanted to give a little bit of 
uh, clarity and, and, and light on the situation of uh, coalition. Yes. Um, I, there's been a lot of interpretation that the DA and the ANC was in coalition. The DA and ANC has technically never, sorry, not the ANC, the EFF. The yeah. DA and the EFF have never been in coalition. The DA mm. and, and EFF voted with each other. So, mm. for example, the DA has been in coalition with the IFP. In, 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 for example, in the city of Joburg, we've been in coalition with the UDM in Nelson Mandela Bay. A coalition is more of a contractual agreement to say that this is how we're going forward. So the EFF did not want to be in coalition. With the DA. They voted with the DA to elect certain members in council. So when yes. other decisions come along, none of the parties are, 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 are obligated or, or binded by something to say, we now have to vote with each other for everything for the next five years. Yes, so there's a difference between voting together and being in a coalition. It mm. seems as though it was a coalition, but it was never a formal coalition. Well, formal, like yes, yes. The and, the, and the ID with the little, or, or the DA and UDM and other municipalities. So yeah, I just wanted to give that little bit of clarity. Thank you. No, thank you, my leader. And to add on what you have just uh, stated or alluded to, we also realize that the EFF has come out strongly saying that they will only vote with certain parties on an issue-to-issue -issue basis. So by doing so, they are also saying that they want to hold their own mandate as to what they decide on rather than use rather than being dictated by another political party. So in that particular context, which is why I've often resorted to using the word co to coexist at that particular moment rather than to say uh, a coalition or to say it is an informal coalition. But then at the end of the day, we must understand that all of these undertakings or all of these processes that we, we are seeing again are a form of coalition at the end of the day because it is certain political parties coming together to do things a particular way in order to try to have uh, or in order to try to reach a different uh, policy or political outcome or economic outcome. But having stated such, uh, is there anyone else that would like to contribute to that? So there are a lot of policy experts and as well as commentators that are always on TV and throughout all media platforms arguing that coalitions are the future of politics in South Africa, right? And it's almost becoming a reality, waiting to see what will happen in the next local government election and again in the upcoming uh, national elections as well as to will the current leading party or will the current governing party reach a status of 50 plus one in order to maintain its dominance in the South African landscape or not, right? So those are some of the questions that are emerging as to is coalition the future of South African politics? And that's a question that I would like to pose to you as to is coalition the future of South African politics? Taking into account the different or the differing ideologies that exist between the, EA, the ANC, the EFF, and the DA, right? So the question is, is coalition the future of South African politics in that context? Or are we rather seeing a process that will only regress the democratic outcomes of, uh, of South Africa? Okay, I can see here that we have we have some input from uh, Simone. So we have uh, some input from Simone saying that this is fantastic. I think coalition starts off with the correct intentions, but depending on the strength of the structures or boundaries put in place, they tend to lose sight of the initial papers of why it was formed. I think a gentleman, as I think a gentleman state, stated yesterday, that uh, okay, give me a second. Okay, I think a gentleman stated yesterday that politicians also started off with the correct uh, frame of mind, but somewhere along the way, the seed or the intention gets corrupted. 
this is where what uh, what was mentioned earlier by Mr. Gubane that which divides us is much more insignificant than what unites us. I believe that because these conversations are happening, this can be the beginning of change to traditional ways of doing things. Thank you, uh, Simone, for that particular uh, contribution. And Lida, you can go ahead and have the floor. Well, Lida, I, I really, really don't mean to hold that discussion to monopoly. It mm -hmm. seems as if I've been dominant, uh, and I don't like that. I, I really want to hear other people's views. But mm -hmm. nonetheless, Lida, I cannot uh, shy away from a platform given. Mm -hmm. uh, Lida, uh, you see, I, 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 I would really like to believe that uh, coalitions in South Africa can never work. Mm -hmm. Precisely because, leader, if you look at the South African political landscape, all political parties are garnering for one thing, and that is political power. Mm. And 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 they can try to, you know, engineer or manufacture a story that says they want political power in order to change lives. But the truth of the matter is, we have been too experienced politically to come to a conclusion that you see in South Africa, uh, before they can even engage in this coalition, they first look at what's in it for them. Mm. Th that is the first thing. It's not an issue of looking at the expediency and the interest of the people that were, were entering in this coalition precisely or primarily because of the interest of our people. No, no. Interest of the people are always secondary. The primary uh, uh, interest which take over uh, for, uh, and dominate these uh, in, uh, discussions and agreements of coalitions, they are of what can we benefit. That is why you even motions of, of, of uh, which are proposed uh, in the provincial legislatures and in the national assembly, you you can look at them. They are no, they are by no means empowering or transforming the lives of the people. They are just an elitist uh, elitist uh, proposals or prepositions, which are not going to have any meaningful impact in the lives of the people. So I'm saying, let us look at any coalition which has ever happened or unfolded in South Africa, and give me a singular one, a singular one, just a singular one, which has been able to impact on the lives of the people in a meaningful way. And look at all the metros or the municipalities which are run through coalitions. They are all dysfunctional. I, I, I may not have proper a, a statistics regarding that, but I'm quite sure of what I'm speaking about. Why is that? It's because political expediency and organizational principles, sorry, not principles, organizational interest, they hijack and overcloud and take over that which was the initial a, 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 a mission or vision of entering into that particular coalition. Thank you, my leader. Oh, thank you, my leader. Uh, so, uh, do you have any other participant that would like to contribute to this? Sushmita, do you have anything to add? Okay. Yes, Ramona, do you have anything to add? I'd just like to say that um, coalitions can work. I feel they can work if we have the right intentions and if the, the two parties involved uh, put the people first and their intentions are for the people, I think it can work. Mm. Nothing is impossible. No. Definitely. Thanks a lot for that. Yes. So coalitions can work. If they work, 
throughout the world, they can also work in South Africa based on the mandates that the political parties have and based on the national developmental goals that are each and every political party has necessarily aspired to and also ensuring that we can come up with common uh, goals as South Africans, right? So just to move on from that. So there are certain types of, uh, co of coalitions that we can also look at. So the pre-election coalitions, those are elections whereby certain political parties come together under one umbrella in order to improve their chances or increase their chances of winning an election. We also have the majoritarian coalitions whereby a group of parties that have uh, the majority vote, say for example, one party has 25%, the other has 20%. Those parties will then try to form a coalition government using another smaller political party to ensure that they form a government of the day. And then we also have what we call conflict resolution coalitions, right? Those are called uh, coalition government that we often see in some of the war torn countries or in some of the countries that have underwent some form of uh, political backlash, such as maybe the coalitions that we saw in Rwanda after the Rwandan genocide. genocide. So those are some of the uh, coalitions that we see. And now quickly running to some of the challenges again, right, to coalition. So as we've, we've covered the issues of differing ideologies, but then we must also realize that coalitions are based on short-term agreements, and they may not necessarily yield the outcomes that we want as citizens, right? And then again, there are also issues of policy uncertainty. So now imagine you vote for the DA, and then tomorrow the DA is voting with the EFF. Then the issue then becomes as to what are you, what is the current that political party standing for, right? And which is why, as you realize that the DA has been undergoing some form of evolution as to what should be their core beliefs or what should be their core principles when it comes to coalitions, right? And then lastly, we also have uh, issues of conflict management in coalitions, of which is the session that is uh, following this. Uh, but before we end this section, uh, is, does anyone want to make any contribution before we move to the section on conflict management? Because one particular thing that is uh, emerging from this is that there is always some sort of conflict that is emerging from coalitions, right? Because at the end of the day, how do you then ensure that political parties that have different, uh, have different ideologies can govern or can co-govern with other political parties as well. So if anyone has anything to contribute, I'd listen to them for the next two minutes and then we can move on to the section on, uh, on conflicts or conflict management in politics. Am I noted? Yes, you can go ahead, my dear. Uh, Lydia, I want us to look uh, directly and, spe and specifically on the issue of, uh, uh, but I'm just going to encompass it, uh, encompass all these elements in one go. Uh, at, at, at political expediency, uh, you know, becoming more preponderant or more exigent, uh, so to speak, uh, to constitutionality. Mm. Uh, you see this thing of major, majoritarianism. Yes. Uh, it, it, it happened. You, you know, we, we, we're told that the constitution is the supreme law of the land. But, uh, you know, uh, in 20, when the public protector issued uh, his uh, her recommendations on the Nkandla issue. You know what, what the ruling party did? The ruling party voted against those recommendations um, inside the National Assembly. And uh, what the president said is that these are merely recommendations. This is not a court verdict. So I'm not constitutionally bound to, to, to adhere uh, to these recommendations. The recommendations are just recommendations. That's what they are. And these are chapter nine institutions. So meaning that leader, chapter nine institutions, they are toothless. They are toothless because they are not constitutionally empowered 
to force the hands of politicians to do what is rightfully needed by the constitution. It took opposition parties to take the matter for, for to, 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 to go to the judiciary, to the, to the constitutional court. And in the constitutional court, the con court made a ruling again. The same issue came back to the very same National Assembly and the very same majority in the National Assembly voted against the findings of the Constitutional Court. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying, leader, I'm saying, leader, this is, we must take this thing and juxtapose it to the one of a, a, a coalition. This thing is about alliances. A party that knows that in the alliance, they have the majority. They eventually do not respect the ones that are minority. Even in terms of consultation, they do not consult anymore. Look at what happened to Monge Zibob in uh, uh, Nelson Mandela Bay. Look what happened there. Uh, do we really think what happened there is just a, 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 a minor difference? No, it is inherent. It is inherent in the in the in the system of of coalition politics. It's there because what eventually happens, in, as I was saying earlier, I still maintain that position. As I was saying earlier, that in 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 coalition politics, agendas, political expedience, organizational interest, they matter most to politicians. So we cannot leave in La La Land, where we're hoping and believing that politicians can wake up tomorrow in the morning and they do what is right. I mean, constitutional processes and organizational processes are flouted all the time so that they can be able to suit uh, narrow political goals. That is oh, what is you. happening. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, my leader. Thank you, my leader. But yes, in as much as there is what is happening, uh, at the end of the day, which is why I ended up touching on the points that what we have seen is the emergence of opposition political parties coexisting in order to try and ensure that the executive for the ruling party is held to account. And again, if you recall that it was through opposition parties working together to influence or to even petition the Constitutional Court to have a look at some of the decisions that have been taken in the parliament, right? So that on its own signals the importance of parties working together. Because can you imagine that, say for example, one political party wants this particular outcome, the other political party wants this particular outcome. But then through political parties having one common vision of trying their best to ensure that political parties or the ruling political party of the day sticks or maintains the rules of the game, right? So those are some of the challenges that we are facing, but then again, through some form of informal coalitions, they have resulted in some results in the South African context because we saw at the end of the day, the public protector report ended up being implemented. We saw the number of, uh, the number of motions uh, motions of no confidence against the president that were uh, mandated. And then we also saw many of the decisions that were taken by courts of the South African uh, law that came up with decisions that showed that these opposition parties that are working together are actually right and they are leaning towards a certain goal of ensuring that the country's democratic principles are upholded by the ruling party, right? So those are some of the things. But then I think one key issue that emerged from all of this is that if there are certain internal mechanisms that are facing, they are mainly facing, fa uh, failing because of conflict management within political parties. And I hope you can see the slide that I have on conflict management. And the key question then becomes as to how is conflict managed by various political parties? And as we know, political parties in South Africa are facing a crisis, right? Whether it can be the EFF, the DA, the ANC, the UDM, the IFP, uh, the NFP, we have witnessed some form of political crisis or conflict management within these particular political parties. And again, if you remember the issue of COPE, there were certain political 
uh, leaders within COP who were arguing as to who is the rightful leader of that political party. So at the end of the day, there are certain issues that are also impacting on the nature of political parties being effective at the kind of work that they do. So which is why then we will also look at or dwell on issues of conflict management. So what are some of the issues that underpin uh, political conflicts or conflicts within political parties, right? So there are four there are four or five issues that are quite pertinent that were highlighted in one report. Right? The one issue is the issue of interest, right? Interests are always at the forefront of political parties or within party structures. As we understand, as local agents of political parties, wherever we come from, one thing that has always been at the forefront, for example, I'd, make, uh, I'd, I'd convince, convincingly make this argument, and it has been stated out there by a number of reports, and including by former President Beg, that majority of the, of the people now are joining the ANC for their nefarious gains and not for the greater good of the organization or of the country, because now they see the ANC as a vehicle to resources. And those are resources that are supposed to be going towards our communities, but they end up being channeled to private individuals for their interests and no longer national interests, right? So the perceived competition of those particular resources or those particular interests at the end of the day end up impacting. And we can even take this as far as the issue of political killings in South Africa. Quite a lot of research has been done by this. We also had uh, the Morani Commission focusing on key reasons as to why there are high rates of political killing in South Africa, and particularly in Wazulu Natal. And if we recall, based on the report, the one issue that was at the heart, it was the control over resources, right? The control over resources has entrenched a system of neo-patrimonialism and a system of corruption in the South African context. And again, it becomes the main cause of conflicts within the leading party and as well as within some other opposition parties, right? So having touched on such issues, and as I've mentioned, the issue of political killings, I will also go back to the point that uh, was made by one participant yesterday, that was mainly focusing on the need to train our local political structures or our local uh, branch executive of the political structures to ensure that at the end of the day, they are there to represent the interest of the society rather than to represent the interest of trying to access control to resources. And again, there are also some other causes of conflict such as relationships. And as we understand, relationships in most cases within political parties cause some form of conflict, right? And this can also be tied to issues of who you are in a particular organization. Are you favored or are you not? And it has become the issue in the South African context that even people who are deserving to be in certain positions do not end up being in those particular positions because Elected leaders more in nowadays are elected based on their proximity to some of the people in the regional structures or people in the higher structures of our political parties. So at the end of the day, we are seeing the movements of political structures in South Africa changing to focus merely on relationship or what we would rather term as rent-seeking interest, right? And then again, there are also structural causes, right? So the unfair distribution of power and resources within certain elements of political parties also at the end of the day cause certain conflicts that start to emerge within various political parties and we've seen this in the number of coalition uh, governments that we have in South Africa also informal coalitions uh, as Osbonis would like to pour it so those are some of the issues that are emerging so in order for us then to take this particular discussion forward, I would like us then to touch base on some of the causes on, of conflict in our local structures, because as I understand, majority of us who are participating in this, uh, in this workshop are coming from local branches. So I'd really like us to then unpack some of the causes of conflict in 
our local structures and how do we then navigate those particular spaces and try to ensure that we come up with conflict resolution models that will enhance the country's democratic principles. And I would like to open that to the floor as well. Sorry, but for just um, reminding us what your question was. Uh, so the question was mainly focusing on the conflicts that are emerging within our political structures or our local political structures. And I think Uspa can assist me here with uh, trying to break away the sessions. I, I can see that we, have, we currently have 13 people that are active probably we can break away in, into, into three groups. Uh, Spar, okay. can you assist with that? Sure, no problem. Yeah, so Spar can assist with that. Uh, I'm going to be in one group, and hopefully Umbale can be on the other group, and Spar can be on the other group. And we will take roughly 10 to 15 minutes, and then we can get back with feedback. Okay, cool. Okay, thank you. Uh, leaders. Leaders. Yeah, over. Uh, I didn't get what was happening. I, 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 I wanted to contribute. Oh, you can move to your group. I don't know if you have an option reflecting there um, to move to be able to move to the breakout room. Mm, You've been allocated okay. to breakout room one. Oh, okay. Let me let me go there. Okay, cool. Hello. Yeah, Mbale. Put me there with breakout room. Yeah. Which one would you like me to to take you to? I am give you. 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 I am
You? You're doing great work, baby. Yes, so welcome back. Okay, this oh, ah, okay. numbers are still increasing. Yes, I believe everyone is back now. Uh, so I'd, I'd like us to give feedback from our, our breakaway groups uh, based on two things. One is what type of conflict are emerging in our local uh, political structures? And two, how are we dealing with such a uh, conflict? I'll, I'll open this to the floor. I was discussing some of these issues with uh, Sushmita on the other side, uh, mentioning some of the foremost or most pertinent issues in the South African context, whereby you realize that at the local level, some people are fighting to be white councillors, and some are fighting for the control of resources in their respective local areas. And in most cases, again, you'll also realize that we often see conflicts whereby local political leaders use their own communities to further their, their goals or their interests within political organizations. So those are some of the conflicts that are pertinent in the South African context currently. And I would like to know more from the breakaway sections that we had. Um. Mr. Sbisi, Mr. Lampe, Ungastalel, Sboni Sbisi. Auntie, Mr. Sboni Sbisi. Sboni, do you want to take the floor? Pertaining? I know you're always prepared, my leader. No. Yes. Pertaining some of the local conflicts that you are facing and how you as an organization are dealing with those particular conflicts? Oh, uh, in, in internal conflicts in, within the organization. Mm -hmm. yes, uh, yes, yes. Well, uh, luckily, uh, uh, as it applies to all organizations, there are uh, organizational uh, structures and there are organizational systems and processes and procedures which guide behavioral patterns of each and every individual. And mm. uh, what must never happen within an organization in order to avoid that conflict is that there must never be a, a character praising of individuals uh, to mm. such an extent that uh, characters of individuals become much more important than the organization itself. Mm. Uh, I think uh, not to uh, um, uh, Comrade Ramona will, will forgive me here for making an example with uh, what uh, uh, Comrade Maimane said when he left the DA. Uh, that uh, you know what happens is that in the organization there are certain people who like to believe that they are more important than other people and they want to take decisions on behalf of everyone without uh, catering or caring about what each and every single member of the organization is saying about that particular thing and uh, there are people within organizations, just like I've been to a certain organization that I'm not going to mention by name, but uh, you know what happens there? They, they, there is no freedom of members. All you hear is that the leadership has decided and you must move in that direction, and they call that democratic centralism. Actually, mm. that is not democratic centralism. Democratic centralism is being abused to suit certain agendas of certain leaders within the organization. Democratic centralism speaks directly to what the masses want. You can never lead as a leader 
uh, outside of the will of the people because you are not leading animals here. You are leading people who are able to, who are capable of thinking on their own, who have emotions. So whatever that you do, you must consider all those aspects. So I'm Thank saying you. the reason why, the reason why uh, there are always conflicts within the organization is that character come in and then to such an extent that in some organizations, we can even, we know for a fact that in some organizations, if you remove their leaders, those organizations will be dead. Their, their leaders have become a brand name. Their leaders, um, have become a center of attention. You know, if you ask anyone about that organization, uh, they'll tell you the, about their, uh, about its leader. They will not be able to tell you about other people. No one should be more important or exaggerated more than the organization itself. That is why it's cause. That is why it causes conflict within the organization and everything else. Thank you, Lita. Thank you, thank you, my leader. And that uh, definitely speaks to the issue of relationships within. In, uh, certain parties or within certain political structures whereby certain individuals are held to a higher level of standard uh, that even transcends through the political party structures to an extent that they become more important there than the party structures. So uh, I'd also like to hear from other political parties as to what are some of the conflicts uh, that are emerging within your own political structures and how do you then resolve some of these conflict, conflicts? We can hear probably from, uh, from the BA and then if we have people from the EFF, we can hear from the EFF. It's and Ramona and then, have their hand and up. Then, okay, okay. Uh, They're both from the DA. Ramona, yes, yes. So Ramona and Sponiso, please, Ramona can go first. Sponisa can go first. I think he had his name. Is that okay? Sponisa, please go first. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Ramona. Um, apologies, Ed. I didn't realize that uh, my mic was on mute, so I just started speaking and you couldn't hear me. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, yeah, I think um, when it comes to conflict, the way I've, I've seen it within the organization and even outside is that, you know, mo most common you'll find that you'll have a common causes with, 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 with someone. So for example, leading up to a Congress internally, you'll have a certain cause and you'll both just agree and flow. You even meet, meet up with drinks and stuff like that. And with, opposite, with, with other political parties, let's just say, for example, when they was trying to hold the president to account a few years back, you have a common goal. And now the, the, the common goal usually expires before the actual agreement or informal agreement that you might have. Mm. And then people start developing different interests and then you start moving in different direction. And then that's where conflict starts kicking in big time, you know? So I think for me, I've just tried to handle it by ensuring that, you know, as a person, you consistently have hobbies outside of politics. You, you spend your time with your family where you're not speaking politics. So politics does not end up consuming your entire life and where it's much easier to deal with conflict, you know, when you're in a happier space elsewhere, where not all your friends are from politics. You actually have people who discuss other stuff like football or anything else. So for me, that's my view on conflict internally and with other political parties. Thank you. Mm, okay. Thank you so much. And Ramona? Um, what I would say is that um, as activists, um, uh, sometimes uh, 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 of what I've heard from some of the activists is that they not they don't grow. And what we need more often is we. Um, and I'm I'm not just talking about DA activists. I'm talking about activists that I've spoken to because. Um, yes. With myself, I, I, an activist and an activist, I don't look at it in coming from different parties because we, sh like we, sh we, we, you know, you communicate when you get to, to a, a person uh, who has been a friend, but they're from a different, a different political party, they will mention this and that, and you know, they will speak about their differences mm -hmm. that they have. And uh, at, at most times is that you are an activist on the ground, and then um, 
you know, you don't see yourself growing. Uh, and I, I feel that leaders should actually uh, uh, really uh, uh, pay attention to the activists on the ground because they are the people that are, are communicating to, to the communities, the people in, within the communities, and they know what is going on in the communities as much as councillors are also there with the activists, but activists are the people who are come from those community communities and work or, or canvassing and doing the campaign and knowing what that individual is actually you know going through so conflict mm. comes where uh, uh, sometimes comes from when an activist doesn't see, see themselves going and when they see somebody coming in the ward and they knew and that person all of a sudden now is developed and they they have a position where this activist has been there for like plus minus five years and there has been no growth. Um, hmm. So there's, as I said, there's different types of, of, of conflicts and, you know, uh, um, it really puts, puts pressure on people, which, which actually causes confrontation at times, uh, which shouldn't be. If we have the right mindsets, when you become an activist and you have the right mindsets for the people, like I've been an activist for like uh, uh, four to five years now. And yes. um, I never really cared about position when I started. And uh, uh, I'm now formally applying for positions because I feel that I am ready because I've received the training. Um, so yeah, we, we need to consider, you know, training and really knowing about the party first before we, we, we want to excel into like a, a proper leadership position because training is key. If you, if you, if you don't have the training, how do you handle uh, conflict? You know, so that is just my take. Uh, we need to be trained. We need, you know, when when a person sees that there's growth within you, we need our yes. leaders to then take us forward and, you know, educate us more so that we can become good leaders in the future and not expect, but rather deliver. Yes, sir. No, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. Uh, so in the sake of time, uh, Spa, do you think we can recap and see how uh, far we go? Auto, and then we can we can we can then take a recap after Umnoto's comment. Okay, thank you, Umnoto. Yeah, uh, yeah, but Spa, you know, as you say, like there's a difference between a leader, no, no, a leader if you go by popular. About go to, aba nyeba amalita angena. In the panel way, Afuna Ukfana, no Nelson Mandela, and in 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 in. So, Bengene with Leo Vision, you which is Funukfana no ban. If Sebe figure parat, he say, Smutu Segmele Dale Roliak, Arasai Dale Roliak, who say Lima, who say involved in, in corruption. Who say a call to Uguti, Guna Bandu Abam Fage Lapa, Betembe, Ugutuzo figure a shinje. So yes, yes. what I'm assuming Uguti Kungaba rise if Guni campaign like ETTP if in a trainer I'm a future leader. You were training Ungang Uguti be watching of one leg, a waban, one leg, a guba in position. All those stuff. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Noto. And yeah, so Dr. for Dr. Paul Kariuki, as you can hear, uh, there is a request that DTP plays an active role in shaping future leaders. And I believe that's uh, an opportunity that you will, uh, will come with both hands and based on our interaction. And I can see who's part nodding here that is quite excited about that. So, <laughs> so which is quite uh, important. So if uh, there are no further comments, I think Spa and I could probably recap on day two and then we can probably close the session. Yes, um, thank you very much, guys. I think for now, we'll go to a, a brief recap on today's session. I think um, firstly, just to thank all of you for the sustained commitment to the process for today. Um, in the morning, specifically, we started off with trying to recap what we had talked through yesterday. 
some of the elements of yesterday's conversation um, included the idea about what does it mean to be a political party? What does it mean for branch executives? What are the sort of structures that exist within political parties in order to enable uh, their functioning as political parties? They identified various roles of political parties within, within society and what the aspiration of those political parties ought to be. Um, we further then heard from Isaac um, around policy formulation and public outreach. How involved or how should political parties begin to involve um, different communities in the process of policy formulation? To what extent is public participation um, something that political parties work towards within the various stages that they implement? Um, and specifically here, particularly because we're workshopping people that are at grassroots, that are activists, that are members of branch executives that are working uh, specifically in communities, we wanted to talk also about what does it mean to maximize grassroots community action? Um, and part of yesterday's discussions also looked like um, to what extent are we able to hold the people that we deploy to positions to account, given the very uh, nature of public office and how often we need to be able to be transparent and accountable in the various spaces that we engage in. Um, and those were the large part of yesterday's contributions. And of course, today then, we then started talking about what are some of the sort of broader social interests, bipartisan campaigns that we've heard of? We spoke briefly about uh, the Fees Must Fall campaign. We spoke about uh, the nature of the TAC campaign um, and, and others. Um, and of course, the idea of the equal education campaign that um, made sure that uh, the, the, the scholar transport was a priority for the Kwasi Natal government in particular. And we saw that with those campaigns in particular, those were social interest campaigns or campaigns that related to um, interests that were not specifically political or party political in nature, but that they were, they were going to benefit everyone in our society. So we, we, we spoke about that and, and specifically there we were trying to link that to saying, as a person who belongs to a political party that is based in a community, it's important to try and identify the types of relationships that you build with um, um, so, uh, social movements, with community-based organizations, um, with other entities within that space that are not necessarily uh, party political of, in their nature. You might encounter certain incidences where those uh, structures themselves might be party political um, because of where the leadership of those organizations come from. But in the negotiation of that space, in the negotiation of the partnership between your party as well as the, the organization, it's important to consider how you go about those conversations because of the very nature that even though some organizations may not be party political, they still occupy a very specific political role um, in the way in which they engage with communities. Um, most, some of our choices and non-choices themselves speak to very political interests that we might have in our, in our community and society. And so uh, we must be very uh, aware of what that means. Um, some of the discussions then came up about um, the interests both of the, of the organizations and values of the political parties those must not be compromised in those in, 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 in the scheme of deciding who you partner up with, who you decide to collaborate with in the, in the in, towards like achieving a social interest campaign. Um, and that's largely what we were able to talk through. And then of course, with Isaac's um, um, in, engagement for the past two sessions, he was looking at um, some of the, the what, what the, the history of coalitions in South Africa has, has been, what the contemporary examples of, of, of coalitions in South Africa has looked like, and what the potential for the future looks like. You see in this country, as Isaac had pointed out yesterday and today around uh, one party dominance, actually um, um, sort of being, being somewhat of some, somewhat helpful, but also a hindrance to the re realization of our democratic values and principles. Um, with the one party dominance, it, it, it generally, whilst it might allow for certain things to go off quite easily, it also means that they, there's very little accountability for some of the decisions that are undertaken. Whereas the, the, the prospects of a dwindling um, um, a single party dominance, where you see that that party is losing tread um, through each and every election, 
there's potential then for an, an, a coalition to happen. But how do coalitions come about? On what basis do those coalitions come about? Are they formal coalitions or are they informal coalitions? As we've heard, the informal coalitions themselves don't have a long-term relationship. Um, sometimes it's very difficult to actually agree principally because the ideologies of the individuals who engage in informal um, coalitions themselves are not clearly defined um, and, and, and sometimes inconsistent on that basis. So that's, some, that's something that um, um, even Usboni so Swisi was able to make us aware of, specifically in relation to the um, um, EFF and, and DA relationship. Um, in, in relation to that, to that same example, was also able to say, um, to some extent, um, some parties within those relationships, um, even if they have a smaller um, 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 role within that coalition party, can end up um, uh, cr creating a difficulty for the ways in which the dominant um, coalition partner um, is able to make decisions. Um, and so it undermines sometimes the ideology of that, uh, of the dominant political partner. Um, and of course, when you talk about conflict management, it's not just about conflict management inside the political party, but it's also about conflict that might arise from the, the person who belongs to a political party internally for themselves, insofar as what values do they align themselves with? Why are they involved in the political space? How can they divorce themselves from the political space in sufficiently to the extent that it doesn't harm the way in which they engage with the rest of the world. And then, of course, we talked about conflict that relates to different political parties and how we're able to resolve each of those mechanisms and so forth. So broadly, um, those, that was the ground that we tried to cover over the past two days. And we hope to some extent it's been useful um, in, 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 in gathering some of your, your thoughts and interests moving forward in the space that you occupy politically. Um, for now, I'll, I'll, I'll just pause there. Isaac, if you want to add anything in the recap. Bob Isaac. Okay, so thank, sorry about this, I was still on mute. So thank you for the participation and for taking your time to join us on this particular workshop. And hopefully you have learned a great deal uh, because we have also learned a great deal from you as local uh, party structures. And as I've stated before, we started with the workshop yesterday that it was quite important for us to be on the part of learning from each other because in as much as we are facilitating from this side, it is you as agents of local parties that are out there that are knowledgeable about the daily activities of political structures. It is you who understand some of the daily challenges that you are facing. It is you who understand as to what needs to be improved in the South African context in order for South Africa to get where it wants to be. And again, as we've touched on uh, the issue of party coalitions today, it is quite a fundamental thing. And I believe that as the majority of South Africans, we really need to grasp the idea of party coalitions as to how do they work, how do we then take them forward, because it is increasingly becoming a permanent feature of the South African political landscape, and it is more than a given uh, mandate that in the next five to 10 years, this country will be governed based on a coalition process. And it is quite important for us then to start navigating spaces as to how do we then as civic society influence some of the decisions that are taken by these coalitions that we vote in. And again, we've also touched on issues of conflict management and the issue of the fight for the management of resources is one of the battles that South Africa is facing. And in most cases, it appears to be a losing battle for the South African government because we understand that we lose roughly 10% of our GDP to corruption every year. And that's the staggering figure taking into account that more than 57% of the South African population lives in poverty. So I believe that we are here and we have a greater role to play in the political landscape. And again, in terms of influencing some of the policy outcomes for this country to get where it wants to be. So having said that, and once again, thank you for your participation for the past two days. And we look forward to engaging more with you. And as Uspa has probably indicated, we will be sending you the slides that we had uh, for the past two days. Thank you, Uspa. Um, as you uh, might be aware, we, we've just launched a poll for the purpose of evaluating day two. 
Um, please, as much as possible, we would like your feedback. Note that the feedback is anonymous, so <laughs> we won't take it personally, but it is important that we evaluate in a way that is um, as um, clear and concise so that we can be able to improve because the work of, of, of doing these types of things, specifically as we are doing it online at the moment, we need to try and make it as, 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 as engaging as possible so that everyone feels that we all, we'll, 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 they, they can be able to participate meaningfully. So the poll is currently running. I see five of the 11 of you or now six of the 11 of you have cast your vote. So please go ahead and cast your, 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 your rating um, and we will do our best to improve on future engagements. Um, just as an announcement, um, please, um, I know that based on yesterday's um, administrative processes, we might not have had an opportunity. Um, please remember to send through the forms um, that you had been sent through for reimbursement of, of fund, of, 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 of data um, back to Suraksha. Um, she would prefer if they are clear and legible in um, a PDF format if you're able to. Um, so that she can be able to, to, to finalize that process um, from an administrative and financial perspective. Um, further today, this evening at 6 p.m., we'll be having a WhatsApp engagement. Um, please make sure that if you would like to be part of that engagement, you send myself an email on the email that I would have been sending you notifications about this workshop on. Um, the, the, the engagement will be about um, how do how do we launch a campaign or to what extent what's what's the feeling of society about the potential to have um, a 50 percent uh, youth led council um, as, as, especially as we head to local government elections next ne next year um, as the campaign is currently picking up pace quite significantly now um, and further and finally um, on Friday we'll be having a, a, a forum with the Mail and Guardian. It's gonna be a webinar that's, going to, that, that's um, with the Mail and Guardian called Pathways to Reform. And they will be having multiple sort of um, political analysts um, who will be engaging on the, on, the, on the conversation around what are the mechanisms through which we can reform South Africa's trajectory at the moment, especially in light of Ilokuzane, um, especially in light of COVID-19. So the slides for this workshop, myself and Ulokuzane, um, Ukambule will be consolidating them and send them through um, at least by tomorrow to you uh, for the purposes of um, just you being able to browse and look through the, some of the content and remind yourselves if in fact you will be having an opportunity to use um, the, the, the information itself. And uh, we'll, we will try also to send through the recording um, for your viewing at, at, at leisure. I know that some people had commented and said um, they were having some, some, some difficulty due to network issues. Um, so if they want to catch up on any aspects of this specific workshop, we will make sure that we have it available for them as well. Um, before we conclude, are there any questions? I think all of you have now or would have now um, 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 voted on the poll itself. Are there any questions or comments before we close? Um, uh, Lydia, one... yes, yes, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Uh, I, I'd really like to convey my deepest and sincerest gratitude uh, to the Democracy Development Program and to all the stakeholders who are involved for having organized such a very opportune platform to discuss critical issues which are facing our country on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. uh, it is very important uh, that we take matters into our own hands and we take our own destiny into our own hands by making sure that South Africa remains a constitutional country the rule of law in South Africa is respected and the right and the interest of our people is championed. And uh, we get such platforms to air such views. So I'm very, very honored and I'm very happy to be part and parcel of this process. And uh, I'm very happy. On behalf of the Student Union, I wish to say, Klina Mundum Nyamo Zabala Zayoklina, uh, and I wish to say to all students who are suffering out there, to all young people who are without hope, 
please come to us. We assist with NSFAS application. We assist with um, placing students in various universities. And uh, you can contact me. You can contact us on Facebook or wherever. We will be able to assist you free of charge. Thank you very much, my lead. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sebong Akulu for accepting our invitation. Um, Noto, your comment? Mm, I would like to say Sebong Akulu with TTP with inviter for late discussion. In Tlega Kulu, Sangat Benga Tubega Nayo, and I'm looking forward to Guti Beskwaz Guskrumela. I'm a future leader there to Asemangane, and uh, I'm looking forward to Guba a part of a group as of Bigu Watapu, and um, Sikona for Labafundi, Aba Bafunu Gritchis, Tema Colleges, Mamba City, Econ EFF Yarichis, a free of charge, Ibaya Sizana, and so on and so on. Thank you, thank you, Lita. Um, uh, any final comment? Once, twice. Bali, you want to say something? Yeah, um, thank you, thank you, everyone, for, for joining us for our workshop. Thank you, Dr. Isaac. It was really informative, and thank you, Brian. Your facilitation is always great. Um, I'm looking forward to our engagement via WhatsApp with the young people as we seek to 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 lobby and advocate for a 50 percent um, youth representation in the local government um, spectrum. Um, we are looking forward to 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 for all the series of events that we we are trying to do. Um, in trying to achieve um, Lendoya 50%. So thank you very much, Siabonga. Thank you, thank you. Um, so for, the, for today's workshop, you can easily just reply to, my e to, to the emails that I may have sent you and say, I would like to be a part of the um, um, WhatsApp webinar and I'll forward your contact details to Umbali who will send you the links as it relates to that. Um, other than that, Dr. Kambule, your final... Oh, Busubongile, what are you? Yes. <laughs> Yes. Uh, so thank you to everyone for taking part. And I can say that to Simone uh, has written to us saying a very, a very big thank you to the DTP team for the opportunity of engaging in this manner. Uh, we hope to use this information to develop democracy in the places that we influence. And most importantly, I think nothing will better that. And hopefully we have achieved the targeted uh, outcome of this particular workshop and hopefully that you will go back home and impart some of the knowledge that you have gathered here today and again also build an inclusive and democratic society in South Africa. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. On behalf of our executive director, Dr. Paul Kariyuki, on behalf of our funders, the Condon Adenauer Foundation, thank you and have a good evening um, and afternoon um, and we look forward to to engaging with you further. Thank you, Sushmita, for your feedback. Um, and to, the, to all of the political parties that are represented in the space, the student movements that are represented in the space, um, we appreciate your, 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 your various engagement. Um, best regards. Thank you, thank you, Prince Sebongakul. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm.